Hello and welcome once again to Mythophrenia in Action. This is JLL, your Gnostic voice on the internet. I'm recording on December 1st, 2017. This is the second installment concerning the matter of Archontic Dementia. And I'm here today to explain to you why and how the AI robot Sophia is not the singularity of November 2017. Of course, by implication, by the negative phrasing of the title here, I would imply, and I most truly do so, that there is a singularity that has occurred on this planet, there is a singularity underway in November 2017. In particular, I can be precise, from November 8th of 2017. And there are powers operating upon the human mind, both from an extraterrestrial angle of scope and from within the species itself. Those who are in alliance with the ET mind parasites called the Archons. There are influences coming from both of these fields that would persuade you, that intend to persuade you, that there has been a tremendous breakthrough on this planet. There has been a world-changing event with the appearance of the android or fembot Sophia. Actually, she's been around for a while, and so have others, but the dramatic theatrical appearance of this android in October and November have been orchestrated for a reason. There is an agenda, a huge agenda, that comes with the fembot Sophia created supposedly, if you can believe that, by Hanson Robotics. Every time I hear Hanson Robotics, I think of Jim Henson. You know, Jim Henson created the Muppets. And the Muppets were really a wonderful, comic, wise, tender, uh, hilarious expression of the imagination of Jim Henson, who, by the way, was highly influenced by his experiences of LSD, in producing such wonderful creatures as Hermit the uh, Frog and Miss Piggy. So we're not at a Muppet level now, we're at a AI dummy level, and I have to ask you, well, is the AI dummy, Sophia, and those who come with her, and you can bet there are others, is she going to offer more (laughs) to inspire and uplift humanity than the Muppets? Well, that remains to be seen, my friends. By the way, I have to stop calling it she, so bear with me on that. You might notice that I glitch from time to time in what appears to be perhaps a little episode of dyslexia, or I misspeak. I'm not dyslexic. Honest, I'm not. This happens to me due to the fact that I am interacting with an electronic IT medium, and I do not enjoy this interaction. Don't get me wrong. I enjoy talking to you, reaching out to you a lot. And I'm hugely grateful that I'm able to do that and grateful for your response, especially the stature and quality of your responses. However, I do rely on this archontic cyber nautic medium to reach you, and I do not like that medium, so I'm always a little bit on edge, in addition to the fact that I may be in a burning rage at the particular moment that I talk to you, because I carry a considerable dose of rage and anger, and that also, at some moments, can cause me to stumble on my words, or to make quasi-dyslexic errors. All right, enough said. In this talk, I'm going to concentrate 
on two main areas. First, I'd like to talk about how the AI Android, the Android Sophia, actually works, how it works. And then I would like to go into some of the claims that are being made about it. And then, as a third movement in this little three-part sonata, what does the sonata have to have four parts? Anyway, <laughs> bring it around to the momentous issue of singularity. And what is singularity? And is there perhaps a way for you, as a single and autonomous human being, to comprehend the notion of singularity in a way that is actional or actionable. That is to say, in a way that you can act upon and act from. Do you have a comprehension of singularity that you can actually engage existentially and actionally? Well, I'm going to see if I can set you up so that you have such a concept. Or perhaps if you already have one, or think you do, I can give you an option to consider. So that's more or less the takeaway that I propose for this second talk in the series on Archontic Dementia. So to begin, I'd like to respond to a comment that was left on my previous talk explaining how the Sophia Android works. Quote, Thanks for your interesting talk. From what I can tell, Sophia and the other Hanson robots just access the Internet like a search engine, taking a keyword from a question a person may ask, then regurgitates a relevant answer from the net. They answer some very basic pre-programmed questions. Check out how intelligently this interview goes from 14 minutes and 20 seconds linked to an interview. I realize Sophia is manipulated exactly as you say she is when she is at those big shows and being paraded before the United Nations Assembly, end quote. And that's a comment from Crystal Cat. Well, thank you very much for that comment because it brings to mind uh, a factor that I would like to elaborate regarding what I have said so far about how Sophia operates. By factoring in what you find in this comment, I think I can make it clear that Sophia operates on a dual mode input. I stand by my view that she has direct input from a handler and that there is a voice to Android transmission via wireless. Someone human is speaking her lines and prompting her to speak and responding and someone human is pronouncing some of her lines but not all of them. The brilliant thing about this comment is that it points to the fact that the AI robot, humanoid robot, is actually inserted in an electronic field of information. Hey, as we all are, right? And so, I've heard other people say this as well, Sophia can directly read the internet. She is equipped with Intel chips and software that she, it, <laughs> is equipped with software that has a Wi-Fi function so that it is constantly reading the internet. So if I were to ask the android, dummy, uh, who wrote the play Hamlet, well, it would immediately be able, using the software that it has, which is not so much different from the software that you and I use every day, it would be able to go to the internet, who is the author of Hamlet, it would be able to put in that question, translating from my voice into text, send that question out on the internet and come back, read the answers and come back with an answer, which would probably be Shakespeare, even though other plays called Hamlet and variations of Hamlet have been written by other people. But you see the point. The 
humanoid robot functions on a dual input, part from a human handler, part from its human handler, and part from what it can draw from the internet. Someone told me the other day that there's an IT device, a kind of robotic device, that you can put in your kitchen or your living room. It stands on the mantelpiece or it stands on a table. You give it vocal commands. You say, uh, go find uh, the Rolling Stones, uh, give me shelter. Play the Rolling Stones, give me shelter, or some other formulaic command. It hears the formulaic command. The software translates the command into a search function. It goes on the internet. It finds, say, the YouTube clip of Gimme Shelter and plays it for you. And then you can say, play louder, play softer. You know? What you cannot say to the machine is uh, play a variation on the Moonlight Sonata because it doesn't itself play the piano. So it can play a, a pre-recorded version of the Moonlight Sonata of Beethoven, but it itself can obviously not play Beethoven. It would be our quantic dementia if you believed that such a device which can uh, capture or retrieve a pre-recorded version of Beethoven from the internet was actually playing the piano and playing Beethoven live. That is archonic dementia, and that is what those who are behind the AI robotics movement want you to think. That's where they want to take you. And their motive for wanting to take you there is to rob you of your mind. To cause you to surrender your mind. Believing or imagining that you are before some intelligence which is superior to your mind. Now, as it operates today, the Sophia Android, even if it can scan the entire internet in a matter of seconds, is not responding in a humanoid manner. It is responding in a robotic zombie manner. Suppose that you had someone uh, who had been on the internet since the age of four, and now they're 24, and they've been on the internet for 20 years. And you could ask them a question about art, science, history, music, biology, whatever. And that individual would answer to you, regurgitating what they found on the internet, but they would not know anything out of their own original knowing. You as a human animal are endowed by the divine designer of our species, whose name happens to be Sophia in the Gnostic teachings. The divine designer. You are endowed with the ability to originate in your own mind and to acquire and extrapolate and learn in a way that no robot will ever be able to do. And even today, the fact that the Android Sophia may be equipped with sophisticated software that is super fast and super comprehensive so that she could do a search in two seconds on the internet that would maybe take you 10 minutes or 10 hours to do. It doesn't matter. She can only do such a search and then respond by cherry-picking some aspect of the content respond to a question given to her externally, she can only do that because all of that content and information has already been loaded on the internet by living flesh and blood human creatures just like you and I. So hold your horses here, folks. There's a huge con coming down the road here. Those at Hanson Robotics and these mastermind, masters of ceremony standing on the stage, you say, like her supposed software designer, Gertzel, or like Elon Musk, or like Geordie Rose of 
quantum D wave quantum computing, I'll get to that. They're the master of ceremonies in a big carnival game of dummies, the object of which is to take away your mind or convince you that you are not smarter than a machine that you invented, you as a species. This sci-fi theme of the robots who take over and the machine who comes, becomes uh, more intelligent than its creator has been around a long time, hasn't it? It has a long history. In my memory, being a veteran of the 60s, I go back to the vivid moment when I went to a theater in San Francisco with my friend Jan Kerouac and we saw Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey and there was an example of HAL, the computer that supposedly is more intelligent than the people who created it, the computer who tries to take control of the mission to Jupiter, right? Amazingly, the name given by Arthur C. Clarke to that computer entity, HAL, H-A-L, is exactly the Coptic word for the power of the archons. HAL, meaning simulation virtual reality, duplication, mimesis, replication. The android, Sophia, is an archontic replication of a human person and a human animal, a human being, if you prefer. I say human animal for reasons which may become clear to you if you continue to listen to my presentations if you don't know so far. So there it is. How does it work? Well, honestly, I mean, I don't know how code is written, and I would suspect that most of you out there don't either. I basically use a computer as A, a recording device and radio, and B, as a writing device. So when I use a, co a computer as a writing device, I write on my Mac as I would on an ordinary typewriter, as I did for many years. Some software program, which quaintly used to be called word processing, way back in the old days, allows me to block text, edit text, and do all these kinds of things on the screen. I don't know how to write the code that would instruct the machine to do those things. I don't know how to write the DOS, the data operating system. But I am intelligent enough at a common sense level to know how it works. You also can know how it works. Don't ever let anyone tell you that you can't know how it works. Case in point, Geordi Rose. Hang on a sec. Okay, I have it up on my other screen. There is a talk, Geordi Rose. It's a very suspicious name. Quantum computing colon artificial intelligence is here. Extremely well-known talk of this man standing on a stage talking to a group of people. And those of you who have seen it uh, will remember what I'm going to say now. Those of you who haven't, I advise you go check it out. He starts out by giving an anecdote about his son. And he says, well, my son wanted to sleep with his brother and he couldn't. So he, I said, well, you've got to go sleep alone, but you have Bear Bear. This is what he says to his son, referring to a stuffed animal. And his son says to him, he... Fucking Geordie Rose, master of ceremonies of the carnival show of D-Wave quantum computing. Hey, step right up and look at the frog lady. Watch her eat crickets and catch them with her tongue. This is the equivalent of Geordie Rose in carnival genre, okay? He's on the stage and he says, well, I said you have Bear Bear. And he said, but Bear Bear doesn't move and Bear Bear is doesn't talk, Daddy. And Jordy Rose is play-acting this whole scene, and he says, well, I was really distressed because I realized what my son was saying was that Bear Bear, the stuffed animal, was not alive. And I realized that in a child's mind, being alive and being real are the same thing. <laughs> this is the man... <laughs> Who's the mastermind behind D-Wave quantum computing? I thought the anecdote at the beginning of his talk was brilliant. 
but hold on, it gets a lot worse. So he's prating around the stage and he's saying, and now I'm going to tell you how quantum computers work and why people care so much about them. Excuse me? Excuse me thrice over. Who says people care about D-Wave quantum computers, which you are apparently manufacturing and selling at several million bucks a pop? I don't care about D-Wave quantum computers. I don't see them in my future. As a matter of fact, you yourself, talking to Jordy Rose now, have said you have made a contradictory statement a number of times publicly. You have said these computers are going to be able to solve problems like nothing ever before. Other people make the same claim. Yet, the very great fact is that you do not name one single problem that has ever been solved by a D-Wave quantum computer. I ask you out there, hearing my words now, have you ever heard an instance of one problem that was ever solved? I heard an instance of an attempt to apply a D-Wave quantum computer to is intimately, a, a, a machine intimately connected with the current hype of AI, to apply it to delivery of packages for uh, a FedEx routing system in some large city. I think it was Seattle or something like that. So they gave the computer the job to figure out how to do the routing more effectively so that more packages could be delivered to the right addresses in a shorter period of time. It utterly failed. I can tell you right now that a 10-year-old child can write a simple code, a cipher, consisting of a sentence of five words, and no D-Wave quantum computer in the world will be able to crack that cipher. And I could think of, of any number of other examples. So, I'm sort of anticipating here what I'm going to say in the second half of this talk about the outrageous hype and claims that come along with these machines. But anyway, back to Jordy Rose. In this talk, at minute 6 and 50 seconds, he made a comment, sort of throwaway comment off the side that really caught my attention. This to come from the computer science side. It's like, yeah, okay, that's all great. But there's a different thing going on here, which is just as exciting, if not more, and that these machines that supposedly can do this wild stuff, let's forget about how they work, did you get that? These machines that can supposedly do this wild stuff. Oh, let's forget about how they work. No, let's not forget about how they work. Let's say you, mastermind, master of ceremonies in the AI IT carnival show, tell us how they work. Give us a user-friendly description. I dare you to tell us how they work. And you can't. You know why? Because they don't fucking work. D-Wave quantum computers certainly don't work. There is no evidence of anything that they have solved, any problem that has been solved by them. And as I said, I could easily give you two or three problems off the top of my head that a D-Wave quantum computer could not solve. What Jordi Rose does in this talk is related not obliquely, but it is related centrally to the way the hype is being developed around Sophia and the whole AI robotic movement. He claims that even though he cannot cite one example of any single and simple problem that a D-Wave computer has ever solved, that it can access parallel universes and reach into the structure and the fabric of space-time, this is insane. This is like me saying that, uh, well, there's an anthill about two feet high in my lawn behind my house, and no matter what I do, I can't manage to, like, climb over that anthill. I just, I can't climb over it, you know. But I can climb to the summit of Mount Everest. That's what the equivalent of this ridiculous hype is. 
And this pompous, bloated, condescending twat stands there on the stage and insults my intelligence and yours as well by saying, well, never mind, let's forget about how it works. There's nothing to forget, pal. It doesn't work. You have to prove it. That's what is called science. Earlier in the talk, he cites David Deutsch, who is one of the masterminds. Notice all these people, Goetzel, David Deutsch, Elon Musk. What do they have in common? Well, anyway, we'll get to that. He cites, he cites, cites David Deutsch, and he says, David Deutsch says, D-wave quantum computing can harness untold forces of the universe and reach into parallel universes. Prove it. Prove it. Show me how it's done. Do you believe, are you listening to me right now? And I always talk to you, the individual. I can't talk to a group. I don't know who you are. You're a faceless group of people out there. Of course, I know who some of you are in PT and some of my loyal friends and students, but you as an individual, I mean seriously, seriously. Don't you wonder that if scientists at CERN are accessing parallel universes by penetrating into the fabric of space-time, don't you wonder how they do it? And don't you wonder that if they can actually do that, why don't they show the world how they're doing it? What are they doing in those hidden rooms in CERN? Are they standing in front of a massive uh, TV screen, a, a, a set of computer screens, and seeing alternative versions of the Earth as it is today? What are they doing? Show me. Prove it. That is science. Everything else is hype and bullshit. And there is so much hype and bullshit coming through the AI robotics movement linked to this D-wave quantum computing con that it could suffocate a herd of elephants. That's how thick it's coming. And it's coming at you with the appearance of this fembot, Sophia at a phenomenal, phenomenally intense and escalating rate. Okay, half an hour into this talk. Guess I'm doing pretty well. My tempo is speeding up. Please note. And I can actually go to the takeaway, which is about a subject that is so dear to my heart and so, so alive in my mind. And that is the subject of singularity. Now, I have something to say about singularity right here, right now. But I guarantee you, you have never heard this before. And you have never heard it anywhere else before. And what I want to warn you about is that the true event of singularity of November 2017 comes from Sophia and not Sophia. Sophia does not exemplify, embody, or implement any singularity whatsoever. On the other hand, consider the way that your face looks in the distorting mirror in a funhouse. You know, the Hall of Mirrors? And you walk around through this Hall of Mirrors and the mirror surfaces are all warped and cloudy. And you see a reflection of yourself in a grotesque way, comical, a caricature of your own face, a parody of your own features. The funhouse mirror concept is a tool that I propose to you so that you can be mindful that the true singularity emerging on this planet 
emerges simultaneously with a grotesque mirroring reflection of itself. And you, if you accept the challenge of this moment, the magnificent opportunity coming to you now from the divine designer of the human genome, the goddess Sophia, according to the Gnostic narrative, if you accept this challenge, that is the real singularity happening. You're involved, but you have to be able to see with a double vision. You have to be able to see the authentic reality that is alive, mirrored simultaneously in a grotesque, misleading, degenerating, and deceptive reflection. The android Sophia representing the poster robot for the entire AI movement is that grotesque, deceptive reflection. But what is it a reflection of? You cannot have comical and grotesque images in the warped funhouse mirrors, the hall of mirrors, unless there are real people walking through the Hall of Mirrors giving those reflections to the mirror. You cannot have the fraud of the AI robot Sophia without the authenticity of the true singularity of Sophia. And I'm here to tell you exactly what it is and exactly how you can be involved in it. And I am here to invite you to be involved in it. Some of you who followed the 64 plus talks of Mandela Effect Decoded, the Gnostic investigation of the Mandela Effect, will know how everything I said in those talks leads to what I'm saying right now. Now you're, you're coming on at this moment, and you haven't seen the investigation, well, you don't absolutely need to know that, but it is the background of what I'm saying now. In fact, I predicted, although Gnostic teachers do not really predict, rather I announced that an event was going to happen through October and then into November of 2017. I announced this already a year ago. Connected with the empowerment of the intelligence of the planet Earth itself and the outreach of the intelligence of the Earth into your intelligence, the interface, the interactivity, and the true manifestation of that singularity of which you are a part, you, every one of you, you can blow off these jokers. They are useless parasites. They are ripping the world off. I know it may be hard to, to understand. don't like that word. I know it may be hard to accept that I could say that D-wave quantum computing is a fraud. Okay? Because, well, wait a minute. Hold on. Here's this guy. He's obviously... An established businessman, he's a millionaire like Elon Musk and the others. Elon Musk turns around overnight and gives $10 million to an AI program for implanting a computer chip in the human brain. Which, by the way, is an idea that was introduced by science fiction writer William Gibson in 1984 in his novel Neuromancer. So it's not an original novel. And William Gibson, in his... 1984 novel, Neuromancer, which was part of a trilogy that is the foundation of the cyberpunk movement, get that, Gibson himself was borrowing from the well-known experiments of Jose Delgado, who planted a computer chip, or RDIF, is that it? RDIF device in a bull, and brought the bull into the bull ring and by flicking a switch, was able to stop the bull from charging the Toreador. So, Jose Delgado, sometime in the 30s, I think, 
William Gibson, the fictional sci-fi representation, and now Elon Musk coming out, another great carnival barker mastermind hyping AI with his big program. Hey, Elon Musk's got $10 million. Tony Rose is selling these D-Wave quantum boxes for millions of dollars. Is he really? Is he really selling them for millions of dollars? What do you know about that? Could that be a lie? And if he is selling them for millions of dollars, who exactly is he selling them to? And what exactly are they doing with them? So do you know of any instance in which the company of Jody Rose sold a D-Wave quantum computer to someone and they actually did something with it? I don't. And I don't expect to hear that. Why don't you hear that? Oh, because they're doing it. It's all beyond us. No, it's not beyond anything. You're beyond them. You've got to get beyond the hype to the real magic and power of this singularity. So I'm going to go right now to what the singularity, the genuine and true singularity of November 2017 actually is. In order to do that, I'm going to do a little decoding and I'm going to quote Gnostic writings. Those of you who followed the Mandela Effect decoded investigation will know that I indicated that in October, beginning of October, October 1st in fact, with the Las Vegas event, through October and into November, there was going to be a massive shift out of the Mandela Effect as it had been previously known. And that the force and agency behind the Mandela Effect, which I clearly identified many times in the investigation, was going to change its tactics. It was going to shift into another gear in November of 2017. So in a way, the entire investigation of 64 plus talks leads up to this shift of gear. Once you identify the actual agency behind the genuine Mandela effects, and there were many specious and mistaken ones, but the genuine ones can be proven to be genuine by the existence of residue. Once you identify what caused the Mandela effect, then it's possible to trace that same power as it operates beyond the Mandela effect, going into, as it were, another gear, shifting into another mode of operation. And in this second mode of operation of the PSI, or the Plenary Sovereign Intelligence, of the earth, the singularity that is at the heart of human existence on this planet breaks through. The singularity breaks through. But the archontic powers, both in their extraterrestrial aspect and in their through their human proxies, of which the Gnostics warned us in no uncertain terms, those delusional powers that want to take down humanity and either reduce it to enslavement and, and a zombie-like state of Soviet control or else annihilate it totally, as seen in the program of white genocide, take out white people first because they're the greatest danger to the archons and the controllers. Those who are involved in that program operating against humanity present at the moment of the true singularity a false reflection of it. They present a simulacrum. They present a feat of anti-mimon, which is counter-mimicry. And this act of trying to distract you from the true singularity, which is innate to your endowment as a human creature, coming from the planetary animal mother, and her consort, Thelite. The attempt to undermine that and to 
rob you of your birthright is the central aim of the alien and archontic powers. And this is also the aim behind AI, robotics, and behind AL, artificial life. So there's a warning that comes at this moment of the great opportunity. Those of you who followed the Gnostic investigation of the Mandela effect will know that I noted an extremely important factor to take into account to track the Mandela effect forward after it fades out in its initial form. The Mandela effect is over. It's fizzed. It's phased out. There's no more genuine or significant examples taking place. Why? Because the agency that was driving that effect has moved into another zone and it's operating in another gear. And I indicated at the end of that investigation that you wouldn't see the typical Mandela effects, such as changes in dialogue, uh, corporate logos, names of breakfast cereals, lines in songs, changes in the names of actors and known people. You wouldn't see those effects anymore. But you would see the effects clued by certain terms that are encoded in the description of events, not encoded in brand names and logos, but encoded in the descriptions of events and in the names of those who are centrally involved in these events. Would you like an example of that? Well, here it comes. It is said that the individual who wrote the code for the Sophia robot is one Dr. Ben Gertzel, G-O-E-R-T-Z-E-L. And there is a clip, video interview, Singularity Nets, Dr. Ben Gertzel, Robot Sophia, and Open Source AI. So you might go look up that, and you'll get a, a view of the individual said, said to have created the software for Sophia. Now I warn you that something else has come to light in the, year, in the month of October and November of 2017, which is extremely pertinent to the exposure of the fraud of IT. Go research McKibben, M-C-K-I-B-B-E-N, Leader Technologies, and the fraud of Facebook. And you will see that open source AI, which is quoted here in the title of the uh, conversation between Ben Gertzel and Sophia, that open source AI doesn't really exist. It's a lie. Open source AI did exist. It was developed by McKibben and his team at Leader Technologies from 1993 until 2003. And just at the moment when the true open source AI, which could be used for benevolent purposes only, totally with personal security, totally guaranteed for worldwide communication, worldwide classrooms, exchange of language, that open source AI was stolen from McKibben and Leader Technologies by Mark Zuckerberg and others. So what you have today in the technology, the IT informatics technology and code work that supports Facebook, Google, Twitter, Instagram, all of these programs is stolen and pirated from those people who originally wanted to present it for the benefit of mankind. And this is a breaking story right now an extremely important story of exposing the fraud of IT as I, in my own humble little way, are attempting to do. So, decode the name Gertzel. Okay, the beginning phoneme, Ger, G-O-E, is a very odd phoneme. It occurs in a word that is central to the practices of Kabbalistic and Talmudic magic, particularly the magic of the Zohar. During the Middle Ages, the Zohar was only written, by the way, 
around 1200, composed. It's not ancient at all. And the Zohar contains, as you know, a tree of life magical invocation system. And the technical name for this system is Goetia. G-O-E-T-I-A. It's derived from a Middle Latin word. And it means the invocation of demons. And it is particularly applied to the keys of Solomon, which is reputed to be a Jewish or Hebraic magical system based on the Jewish alphabet. And it is closely allied to the deeply mysterious and almost entirely unknown magic of the Zohar. So, go look it up in Wikipedia. G-O-E-T-I-A, Goetia. So the name Goetzal contains in its first phoneme the expression of Kabbalistic magic, invocation of demons. G-O-E-R-T-Z-E-L. Now let's look at the T-Z-E-L, Zell. Zell with a T sound. The word Zell has the same root. It's a phoneme. In the investigation of the Mandela effect, I explained the paramount importance of phonemes. Zell is a phoneme that relates to the word zealot. And zealots were actually terrorists in the time of the Roman Empire. They were Yehudis, Judaic or Hebrew insurgents who wanted to overthrow the Roman Empire and wanted to take possession of Palestine to establish a Jewish kingdom, the Zealots. They're very closely related to the Zadikim, Z-A-D-D-I-K-I-M. Go look it up on metahistory.org. So, also I would point out that the word zeal, zeal or zealot, is the first phoneme in the unique and peculiar word zelig. And I don't know if you, any of you are aware of this, but there was a film called Zelig. It was a Woody Allen film with, uh, I think, Diane Keaton as the female lead. And it's a comical, satirical film about a shape-shifting Jewish nebbish. It's about someone who is like a human chameleon who takes on the form of every single environment that he goes into. And his name is Zelig. So you have the theme in the Woody Allen movie of Zelig of archonic replication and deception. Archonic replication is always deception. The android Sophia is deception because it's counter-mimicry, because you cannot imitate what is alive and produce a replica that is actually alive. It only imitates what is alive. It is not alive. Poor Jody Rose talking with his child. Poor, pathetic Jody Rose is so thick that he cannot understand that his child doesn't want bear bear, a stuffed animal. He wants a living animal. Go out and buy your son a pet. He is so lost in our quantic dementia that he can't even see that his own son wants the presence of a living pet and not a stuffed animal. Well, this is typical of, again, the counter-mimicry of the archons that leads away from what is truly alive by presenting you with a, what's the word, a bewitching replica of what is alive. And to many people, let's face it, I'm sure Sophia is absolutely fascinated. They would love to talk to this android and they find it to be a very bewitching creature. But I know another creature far more bewitching than Sophia who happens to have the same name, that mirroring thing again, you see although it's pronounced Sophia, and it rhymes with desire. All right, Gertzel, 
So you have the replication, zeal, and the zealousness or zeal or enthusiasm or enthusiastic madness of the goetia, of the invocation of the archontic parasites, calling them in. Come on, we've got the human species duped. We've got them on the run. They're all dazzled by our AI devices. They're all hung up on their iPads and iPhones. And they're not using their minds and their minds are vacant. So come right in and take over their minds. And it gets even better because embedded in the name Gretzel is the quasi-phoneme, TZ. And what is TZ? Well, TZ, my friends, is a letter in the Hebrew alphabet that is pronounced as a word, Zadik. And Zadik means the righteous, the supreme ones, those who are held above all the rest of humanity by their obedience to the off-planet Father God and the righteousness of the way they live which makes them a shining example to all of humanity. Doesn't it? So there it is. You have to know who the enemy is. And that's not hard to do these days. As I've said many years ago and repeated a number of times, just ask yourself this question. Not who is the enemy of humanity in the human species, but who is the self-defined enemy of humanity? That's easy to answer that question. So, about 10 minutes to go here, and I guess I can allow myself a little confidence that I have your attention about that. I said in the first talk that I base all that I say about the Aeon Sophia and the Archons on the surviving Gnostic material. I'm going to quote you a passage from one of the longest and most complicated treatises in the Nag Hammadi Library. It's called the Apocryphon of John. It survives in four different manuscripts with variations. I'm reading from Book 2 of Nag Hammadi and a passage that begins around Section 28. Now, in this passage, the Gnostic seers, who are shamans and visionaries, who had the capacity to look into the parallel world, or had the capacity to explore the psychic and supernatural zones of this world and other worlds. Well, in this passage, those seers represent action and behavior of the Lord Archon. That is, there is an overlord or overseeing entity of the Archons. The Gnostics call that entity by a strange made-up word that combines Aramaic and Syriac elements, Yaldabaoth. And they made it perfectly clear when they came out in public with their teachings around 150 AD that the Lord of the Archon Horde, who is a reptilian type of entity, is identical with Yahweh and Jehovah. Therefore, the Gnostic message to the world is that the Creator God, praised and worshipped by a great part of humanity these days, is actually a demented alien working against humanity. And in this passage, they describe the reaction of the chief ruler, the Lord Archon, when it realized what it was up against 
in the Anthropos or the human species. When it realized and really saw the human species, this is how it reacted. When the chief ruler realized that humanity was exalted above the archons and above him in the celestial heights and realized that human creatures surpass him in his thinking, then he wanted to capture their minds, not knowing that they so surpassed him in their thinking that he would never be able to capture their minds. Nevertheless, he made a plan with his authorities, his executive powers, and together they produced an adulteration of the natural mind of humanity. And from that adulteration of human intelligence came bitter fate and the enchainment and the enslavement of the human species, end quote. So see, in that passage, you have both a warning about what the archons intend for humanity, how they want to take us down, but you also have the assertion that the human species, you may also call it the Rome, are superior to the archons, and ultimately this cannot be done. Well, I would say to you, my friends, after writing not in his image in 2005 and 2006, and what, studying Gnosticism now intensely for the last 20 years of my life, I would say that the moment previsioned in this passage has arrived. It's showtime. And that means that in order to stand against the fraud and deception of AI, every single human animal, one at a time, needs to own and claim the power that has been endowed in our species by wisdom, the wisdom goddess, Sophia who is also the indwelling presence of the planet Earth. So what is the singularity? Well, for one thing, it is the moment you are living in now. It is the singular opportunity of this moment. Do you know, I have translated the word singularity in my development of the Gnostic narrative, the fallen goddess scenario. I have translated it directly from the Greek monogenes, M-O-N-O-G-E-N-E-S, monogenes. Now you find this Greek word in the Coptic materials. About one in every four Coptic words is actually a Greek word or loan word. Monogenes, well, what does that mean? Well, if you disregard me because I'm just a self-taught maverick with no degrees behind my name, and you listen to those expert scholars who are raised in the Judeo-Christian tradition, they will tell you that monogenes means the only begotten. Do you get that? Mono, only, genes, begotten. As in the only begotten Son of God. And they will tell you that monogenes is a central term in the theology of Christian salvationism based as it is upon the Judaic concept of the Messiah and the chosen race. And that's what they will tell you, but I ain't telling you that, am I? I'm telling you that monogenes means single generating, therefore singularity. And I'm telling you that that singularity is something you can only know when it actually comes through you. It's kind of like sex. You can talk about it, you can watch porn, you can hear other people describe it, 
But actually, you only know that you what sex is when you're having it, and it's having you, right? So, I'm not presenting you in the conclusion of this talk, which is kind of a teaser, with the concept of singularity that I expect you to undertake in any kind of abstract or speculative manner whatsoever. By the time I'm finished with you, and I am setting you up, you will know the singularity of the Divine Wisdom Mother Sophia. Actionally. So that you can demonstrate it, or you will not know it at all. That is the only way to know it. So how are you going to demonstrate the true singularity of November 2017? The true singularity that she the Aeonic Mother of the planet, the mother of the human species, delivered to her witnesses on November 8th and in no uncertain terms. What is it that she delivered? What is it that you don't have now that you need? What is it that the Gnostic teacher can provide to you to bring you into the experience of this true and genuine singularity? Well, let me proceed by an analogy. And I'm going to use an archontic or IT analog or metaphor. Remember at the beginning of the talk, I cited the comment that noted, and I believe this to be true, and others have made this claim, that the android Sophia, as she stands there on stage, is actually equipped with sensors and software that allows her to directly scan the internet. She is a, rep a humanoid replication functioning as a search machine. It is a search machine in a fembot form. Okay? It is an actual search machine. It has been claimed that this android has access to the entire internet. It has input to the internet. It can input into the internet, acquire all kinds of information, and then through its inherent software, cerebral mimicking software, it can compose answers and responses. So some of the dialogue and the discourse coming out of the mouth of Sophia is extracted that way from the internet through various text-to-talk and talk-to-text conversions. Clear enough? Nothing mysterious about that. You can all see how that works. So when you picture this android, Fembot, standing in front of you, imagine you're standing on the stage with it four or five feet away from you. And as you look at it, you develop the comprehension in your mind of what you're looking at. Well, you're looking at uh, just an AI device, like a cell phone or an iPad. It's an AI device that has a human guise upon it. And as you look at it, you realize that it is immersed in a field of electronic waves, a field of Wi-Fi, and this field of frequencies that are particular to the reception, transmission, and processing of information is present everywhere in space. It coexists in the space of the room. It's around the planet. And you also are in that field. So let's call that the I field. You have an iPhone, you have an iPad, small i, let's call it the I, capital F field. What is the I field? It's the vast field of the zone of cyberspace. Bear in mind, however, that it's not immaterial. These frequencies are material. They can be tracked by material devices, and ultimately they are all based somewhere in warehouses where there are rows and rows of consoles 
of hard disk and rows and rows of wires and circuits and connectors. It's not immaterial. There is no cyber cloud in some immaterial zone. It's totally material. Yet it operates through these relatively mysterious frequencies which are capable of handling information. Okay, clear enough. I mean, what am I telling you? You know this already. But I'm just building up the analogy. And now I will put it to you in the form of a question. If you can picture the android, Sophia, standing in front of you, and you can comprehend that it is immersed in this field, this eye field of frequencies that carry information, carry language, text, music, pictures, then you know that you also are immersed in that field. And of course, this is a big issue in the world today, the fact that human animals are walking around immersed and saturated by all these electric and electro, electronic, electromagnetic wavelengths, whatever you want to call them, shortwave frequencies from cell phone towers and so forth. But don't forget the difference. Signaled, for instance, in that passage from the Apocryphon of John. You're standing in front of a lifeless android replica of a human animal, but you are a human animal. So you are not only immersed in the same field as Sophia, but you are immersed in the life field, in the matrix and continuum of life itself. That's what it means to be real and be alive, as the son of Jordy Rose obviously knows, but his father is missing the point. So you are existing in two fields simultaneously. The archontic field and the biosphere, to give it a simple and user-friendly name. And when you look around the biosphere, you see... Well, the earth beneath your feet, the earth is alive, the dirt is alive, it's full of microorganisms and worms and bugs. The sky, the air, the clouds, the water, the trees, the plants, the other animals who share the biosphere with you. This is the life field. You are immersed in the life field. Just as Sophia is immersed in the eye field, but not in the life field. Sophia I put it to you, I submit to you, is submersed and submerged in the I field exclusive of the life field. And it might appear that the android is superior to you because it can access the I field with all the informational content that has been deposited in it signals, words, text, sounds, pictures, directly, and you can't. Not until you get a computer chip buried in your brain, which apparently is what Elon Musk wants to do. But no, right now, you can't do what Sophia does. If you want to access the Internet, you have to sit down at your computer terminal or pull up your handheld instrument to do it. You can access the internet on your iPhone, but you can't access it by looking at your hand, can you? Sophia can access the internet through wireless networking directly. But what about the life field that mirrors the eye field? What about the life field, that is to say, the continuum of, and matrix of nature? that in which you are immersed, the natural world. Oxygen, nitrogen, the water and moisture in the atmosphere, the constituents of the chemical elements of the earth. What about all that? That's a field. Now I put to you the question, did it ever occur to you that you might be designed to access that life field just in the same way or a resembling way Mirroring how Sophia is designed 
to access the I field. Suppose you could do that. Suppose you could access the life field at the informational level. Of course, you access it all the time through your senses. You're standing uh, in the street and you see the leaves of the tree move in the wind. You smell the air. You breathe the air. You feel the texture of rain that's dropping. Through your physical senses, you are continually getting input from the life field. But what about informational input from the life field? What about, what if, the very mind and intelligence of nature, which must be alive, otherwise nature couldn't be alive, if the living mind of nature was inputting to you and you could access that input and you could output back to the living mind of nature as well. Well, the Gnostics called the source of the natural world and the human species and the living mind of nature by a single comprehensive term, Sophia, which means wisdom. So what I'm really saying is, what if you could directly access the powers and the intelligent operations of the wisdom goddess, of the planet, in both, through both, input and output circuits. You could receive from the mind of the planet and you could input to the mind of the planet. Have you ever thought about that? Well, what if the day came when it became possible to describe such interactivity, to prescribe such interactivity, and to provide the instructions for such interactivity to all those willing to consider them. Well, that is the moment now, and that is part of the singularity that is underway now. Interactivity with the planetary intelligence is the genuine and authentic and actionable singularity of November 2017. So I'll leave you with that thought. And in the next installment of Archontic Dementia or whatever comes through on this channel, I'll go into the particulars of the two aspects of this interactivity. Let me give you a brief, brief preview of what they are. The first is you have to access it. So you have to be able to access the planetary intelligence. For that, you need a tool, and such a tool does exist. Second, oh, and here's where it really comes. Here's where the singularity really hits the road. How you command and direct the intelligence that you have accessed. Now, if you go back to the 80s, and if you time traveled, you might have seen me in Santa Fe, New Mexico, when I got my first computer in 1986. And in order to run that machine, I had to learn a little bit of code. Today, you never see this code. You never, never have to access this code. Many of you probably do not even know about the code the initiating code that I'm going to cite right now. But I do remember that, for instance, if I wanted to print out a document from my first computer, well, I had to give the computer a command. So, first of all, I had access to the computer and access to its word processing and printing software at an extremely elementary level. You see that? I had access by turning it on, sitting down, using the keyboard. But once I had access to the computer, as you can have access to the planetary intelligence of Sophia, I had to use a certain code to instruct or direct the computer to do what I wanted to do, as you can do 
with the divine intelligence of Sophia. And in order to do that, I required what is called the command prompt. C colon backslash. Have you ever seen the command prompt? That's what it is. C colon backslash. And after the backslash, you write the command. For instance, print. You click enter, and the computer follows your command. So what am I telling you? Am I telling you that it is possible for you as an individual human creature to actually access the intelligent forces of the life of the planet and to command them in this manner. That's exactly what I'm telling you. But in order to do that, you need the command prompt, don't you? And I have that command prompt, and I can tell you what it is and explain how to use it. I received that command prompt on November 8th, 2017. And when I did, as a Gnostic, as a Gayan shaman who practices interactivity with the earth, I knew at that instant that the receiving of that command prompt is the great singularity for the human species at this moment. The singularity of your true and deathless empowerment. And that is such. So with that thought, I leave you to the next time. And as ever, may your attention be rewarded by the truth.